I'm Bethany Pratt with Jefferson County Cooperative Extension. We're out here in the William F. Miles Community Garden um, with gardeners. We're in the middle Bill. of the growing season okay. now in June, so it's time to start doing um, some disease scouting. Um, Kentucky is known for our hot and humid summers with um, thunderstorms maybe even on the horizon. Um, so all of that heat and humidity um, and that rain variability brings with it a lot of times a lot of our fungal diseases and some bacterial diseases as well. Um, so we're going to take a look around and kind of start thinking about um, what we are seeing in your garden and how we can prevent it or manage it. Um, Hopefully other gardeners are not seeing this, but if they are, we'll be able to tell them Exactly. To One of the best things that you can do um, is this IPM scouting guide for common pest and solanaceous crops from UK Extension. Um, this is also available online. There'll be a link in the chat um, for you to check it out. Um, there's also hard copies available at the Extension office. Um, but this is a really nice primer of many of the common diseases that we'll see in Kentucky. Um, I love bringing this out with me in a hard copy. You can have it on your phone. Um, and it's a great way to kind of, as you're walking around checking your plants, just to kind of see, see what's going on and figure out what you need to do. Another really important thing to bring with you is a little bit of sanitizer solution. So we've mixed up a bucket here. Um, it is one part bleach and 10 parts water. Um, and this is ready in case we need to do some pruning. The other thing we've brought, um, have some hand pruners, um, or if you've just got some scissors from your house, both of these are great. I'm gonna sanitize them, just give them a little swirl in here before we get started, prop them up, and we'll come back to those when we're ready. So Bethany, the first thing I'm seeing are these, my friends are saying, when are the tomatoes coming? When are the tomatoes coming? Well, the good news is they're here. The bad news is they're black. I don't think anybody wants black tomatoes. No. So, so what's happening that sure. it's spreading among several of my plants that have these? Yeah. So a couple of things that we can look at is a lot of our fruit, fruiting challenges have to do with water availability in our plants, right? We love those nice, juicy tomatoes. Right. And we get a lot of water, a lot of rain. We get a lot of, you know, good, juicy tomatoes. If we get that inconsistency in rain, so maybe we have a lot of rain and we don't, right. which is kind of where we're at right now, we right. start to see some fruit-based well, blossom end rot. It's a little uncharacteristic here because we don't have it on the end right. um, because your fruit's really small. Um, this is just that inconsistency in water that we're seeing on our plant. Okay. We obviously can't control the rain. Um, you can think about how you want to control your watering and your watering schedule in between here yep and you've got some other fruit rot here um and these really easy to manage early in the season pull it off we're gonna create a little compost pile right that way if if there's you know any insects that have laid eggs in here this one's kind of got some other cracks on it or bacteria that's starting to show up we're just removing that totally out of your garden okay we've got plenty of time in the season your your tomato plant here is already putting on other flowers so i wouldn't stress too much about it um, you know, and think about your watering plan, um, you know, and trying to match it in some ways to the weather. Right. Um, that goal well, it's always... it's hard to turn off the rain. It really is, and that's, that's the, that's the hardest part about gardening in Kentucky is, you know, today we're supposed to get two inches of rain. Right. Maybe, we'll see. Right. You know, and we might not get any more for a week, or we might get two inches of rain every day for the rest of this week. And that's, that's tough. Um, but... Just kind of doing a little maintenance as you're kind of seeing this is an easy way to keep it going. When we were looking at this book before yeah. we started, you know, I kind of got horrified. There are like 50 different items. <laughs> when you guys All get this these. book at home, there are like yeah. over 50 items that pictures of things that can go wrong with your tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess is less than a million we talked about. Right. But uh, what's going on with these leaves here? Yeah. I mean, should we be concerned? So you are, I've got it open. Here. So we're starting to see a little bit of early blight um, on here. So that's on page 16. Um, so this is characterized, this is a fungal-based blight that comes up with a lot of those warm storms from the Gulf. Okay. Um, so this is where it came from. Um, and it's very characteristic of having these brown leaves. It tends to start at the bottom of our plant and really work up. Right. Um, and this is where pruning comes in really good handy. So. This, this is moved around mostly by water. Um, so by so these kind of lesions that we're seeing here are that mature 
um, mature disease that can splash and transfer from leaf to leaf with water. Okay. So we, we saw sanitize our pruners earlier. Yep. Um, this, right, if we remember, this is a whole leaf right here, you know? Right. Just like these, there's all these little leaflets in this one leaf. And once you're starting to see disease on any single leaf, we want to go ahead and remove this whole leaf structure right at the, at the kind of the stalk. Okay. So I'm just going to prune this off. I'm going to add this to my compost pile. Um, we always want to move our disease out of the garden when we're done. Um, leaving those disease leaves on the ground here is just a ripe way to keep it from keep it circulating in your system. So if you catch the blight early, I mean, once blight gets in plants, I mean, it can take the plants down. Absolutely. If you catch it early enough, we can we can survive. control it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the last thing I'm going to do, right, is these pruners are nice. Um, they do a good job of giving us a clean cut, but we want to make sure we're sanitizing in between each cut. So I'm going to give them a little swirl in here again before I prune any other leaves or even move to another plant. Um, we can sometimes accidentally be the biggest disease vectors in our garden. Um, so just using your sanitizer and your pruners around um, is a pretty easy way to do that. Actually, right behind us here, okay. this is another one of our more, um, this is a more characteristic um, bit of early blight. Um, so these yellowing leaves that are moving to brown at the base of the plant. Right. This is pretty characteristic of early blight here in Kentucky. Um, and this is the time of year where we start we're seeing it happen. Pruners. We're going to take it all the way back. We're going to take it all the way back. Have we disinfected this already? I have. Okay. Good check. Yep. And we're going to move we're that out of the garden. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then we're just going to take a look at this plant again and see if we're seeing any other impacted plants. And from here, we're going to move and start looking at the plants immediately next to it. Right. Because um, these are waterborne pathogens. They don't move very far. So it tends to be if you've got one impacted plant, it's mostly just the immediate neighbors that are okay. going to be affected next. We have just a little bit. Yep. All right. So if you want to sanitize, and you can do a snip. Perfect. I can take your disease leaves if you want to. You see any others on there. We're catching it early. Removing one or two leaves is not going to hurt your plant. In fact, you're going to have a net benefit. When we but start if you seeing, let the blight go too long, then you end up taking all the plants Precisely, out. yes. So our goal here, right, is to catch this early, make this kind of a part of your weekly, you know, or bi week you know, right. multiple times a week yeah, kind you, of you gotta, check. Yeah, you have to do it multiple times a week, right? And if you do it once a week, I mean, it'll spread pretty quick. Exactly, right? yeah. So I, you know, if you're coming out here two, three times a week to water, it's the perfect time to, you know, bring your pruners and your sanitizer and do a little, do a little checking as we go. Right. Okay. All right. So let's maybe look at some of the other plants around here. See what else. Leaf curl is one of the more challenging things to diagnose on a plant. Um, yeah, I read that it, there's like dozen, it could be a dozen reasons right. for it. Right. And some and of some it could severe be severe and some not. Right. And some of it could be as simple as the plant's really hot been hot and sunny so it's just the leaves have curled up to try to retain moisture right that that's one option um it may be some insect pressure some insects will will use the leaf actually as like a blanket almost and kind of move into there that way um you can also see um leaf curl from herbicide drift um right and in a community gardening setting that might happen depending on what your neighbors are doing um it could also be there are some diseases um, that are more root and soil related that are a part of leaf curl. Um, in this case, your plant, other than funky looking leaves, I mean, it looks pretty healthy. Seems very healthy. Yeah. Color is good. Yeah. And that. And this is where, for me, I would start getting my guide out because this is right. As we talked about all those, these are all the options that kind of rolling around in my head for leaf curl. Um, so I'm going to grab my guide real quick and kind of just thumb through and see if we can oh, identify okay. some different wilts going on here. Um, and this is where this is this nice fun game of match the disease with the picture. Well, the pictures are good. The pictures are great. Um, and you are I'm not seeing, so the tobacco mosaic virus and the wilt virus are the most common that we see here, which is not what you've got going on. This is a cucumber mosaic virus. 
but it's for tomatoes, right? Right. So it sounds like our cucumber plant right next door might have something to do yeah. with it, but it does. Oh, it does. Okay. Right. So this is our description here. Symptoms of cucumber mosaic on tomatoes are varied. They include stunting, um, which we definitely have, right? We have yeah. stunting, right? We've got some shortened leaves right. going on in these plants. Um, yellow green modeling of leaves. Um, we don't really have that. You've got nice, healthy green leaves. Right. You've got a healthy plant. Um, and then filiformity. So that's kind of like they're they've got dis disfigured shapes yeah. here, which we definitely have. Right. Um, the plant's leaves often have a strappy or shoestring appearance. Um, and this says the virus is vectored by aphids. So now we need to start looking at your plant to see, are we seeing aphids on there? Okay. Um, and that's gonna kind of cue us in um, on what's going on there. So aphids, if you're not familiar, they are teeny tiny. Um, and so they may even look like pins or like black spots on your, oh, on your really? plant. So they're not like our bigger pests that we'll see. So, so they're, they're gonna be really little. Oh, yeah. See. Yeah, so let's kind of take a look here, see what we can see. Are they typically on the front or the back of the leaf? Good question. So most of our insects like to hang out on the back of the leaves, particularly on sunny days. Okay. Um, so doing a good inspection of the undersides of your leaves is a great way to, to look for them. Oh yeah, here we are. Something we could really easily mistake is just some dirt yeah. that splashed up. Yeah, so these little tiny dots here are our aphids. Um, and where you've got some, you generally have more. So we're going to keep so keep looking around. They do not have to get on every leaf to have leaf curl. Right, once no, they, they don't. So Once they infect the plant. Yeah, so they, can, they will be coming around. Um, the good news is, right, so this is, oh, and you also have... Wow, you got a lot going on on this plant. So this is right. So we have a diseased plant, which means that it of, often becomes a host for many things. And it becomes weaker. And it becomes weaker. So here is a tomato hornworm. Yeah, this is a nice little, little unicorn horn that it's okay. got on the top. Um, and these these are actual leaf eaters. It's kind of started to actually munch mm -hmm. on the leaf itself. Oh yeah. Um, if you've ever come out in the garden and seen like maybe it looks like something just like stripped all the leaves off of your tomato plants right. that's this this little thing right here um and it was probably attracted to this plant um because it was already a little bit injured by the aphids and the cucumber wilt that we're seeing here right um so it's starting it's yeah, just kind of starting to plant so do, i mean i've got lots of I guess we gotta talk two different ways. Right. If you only have one tomato plant or two or three, your strategy might be different than mine. Mm -hmm. I got lots of tomato plants around, mm -hmm. plenty to do. Yeah. With so much going on on one plant, you kind of give up on this guy. Yeah, and, and so. Give him a good funeral and move on. I, you know, and I think in this case, it, that may be a good choice. We've got a couple different um, insect pests going on. One of which is just right, a, what we would kind of consider a topical pest, right? It's just destroying the plant, right. but it's not, impacting it like it's health okay and then we have these aphids with our cucumber wilt that is giving this, this whole plant right it's clearly impacted by this virus right um and so right so now you've got that and now just like before when we were looking for the southern blight yep. we need to look around and see do you have other tomato plants here that maybe you're starting to exhibit these same right. things um so we can start by just moving next door right okay. our closest plant So far, so good, right? On this one. Yes. This one, we've got we've got a little bit of the early blight, but we're not seeing the aphids on here, which is awesome. So this this plant looks healthy and this looks good. Right. Um, back here, though, we were looking. We do see two that have that same cucumber wilt going on, right? So, and we can kind of check these out. It's got that same kind of shoestringy leaf. You've got some mature, more mature aphids on it right. um, over here. And I bet we would find something similar on the other one. So now we're starting to see this is this is clearly 
this one virus is spreading some. Right. And so it might be time for the good of, for the good of the community to say goodbye to maybe these two to three severely impacted plants. Now, if you were, I don't want to make your life hard, but if you were at home and you only had a couple plants, would, yeah. you, would you try to work with these at all? I mean... Yes. Um, so some of the wilt viruses are a little more challenging to control, um, right? Because the virus is impacting the health of the plant, but the vector is the aphid. Right. So we're a little more limited in how we can manage that because we're what we have to do is we have to manage the aphids. Okay. Um, aphids are a very common garden pest. They're also a pretty generalist. So they, they feed on lots of things. Okay. Um, and so with that, we have a variety of right insecticides that we can utilize right. um, if we want to go that route we can also do um, so an insecticide when I'm using that term is anything that you are applying to a plant organic or not okay um, that is specifically meant to deter insects from landing on the plant gotcha right and then we can get into more details from there right so that's one option um, we also have biological control which means that we're gonna invite specifically some other insect in that's going to eat the aphids. Oh, wow. Um, and that's another option. Okay. Ladybugs are probably our most popular choice for that. Okay. Um, ladybug larvae, um, they're kind of like the Pac-Man of the insect world. They just walk along and they just munch, 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 munch. Um, and they will, they will like just vacuum up aphids. Okay. Um, so the benefit there, right, is you have not put anything on your plant in terms of an insecticide. Right. Um, Downside is you've got to right go find your ladybugs. You've got to you know you get you get them as eggs. Okay. So you get the eggs. You release them in your garden. You wait for them to hatch, um, and then they they hatch, and then they have to walk and find your insect your your plant. Long term though, having a lot of ladybugs here, right? Right. You're you're doing preventative right. work as well. Um, but and, you're taking that approach now. I mean, Time they got going on, I mean, we could lose all our right, right, right. So in this case, this maybe maybe the, the beneficials are not the good short term solution. Right. They may be a good thing to pair with something like just physical removal. Okay. If that's your choice here, right, specifically. Um, or right, if you're really dead set on keeping these plants alive, then we're wanting to think about some, some other chemical. some other either chem, some kind of spray spray solution, right? right. It may not. Um, to go forward with that, um, and there are lots of different things on the market. Um, for there, it's a it's a going to your to your preferred store right. and reading the label. Um, there's there's lots of that fine print right on the bottoms of those insecticide labels. Um, no matter if it's organic or a synthetic, okay. they will all tell you what they control, and you will want to purchase one that specifically says aphid. Gotcha. Um, and kind of move from there. If that's okay. Well, we're going to remove them since uh, we talked. There's just so much else mm -hmm. going on here, and uh, hope that they're kind of isolated just these three plants. Yeah, and I think right. So kind of looking, maybe these two plants just behind you be would dangerous. be. They might be in danger, so they're just ones that you might want to keep your eye on. Right. Okay. Um, but they don't. At this point, I don't. They don't seem like they're they're ready to move out. So we've talked about, so far we've talked about <laughs> in our list of In our book of items. diseases, right? Um, um, black pops, blossom and rock. We've talked about light. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about aphids. And we've talked about the hornworm, right? Yeah. And just four or five plants. Right, right. You kind of have, you do good and bad, right? You kind of have the cornucopia of um, disease pressures right. happening here. Um, but the key foundation to all of this is when you're looking at your garden as a whole, right. nothing really looks diseased, right? Right. So this is really all about management and plant health. Okay. Um, so the healthier our plants are on the whole, the better are we, we are able to come in and do things like pruning, right? To right. help control disease. And then the less likely our plants are to succumb to any of those diseases because they've got kind of a good balanced diet. Right. Right. on their own. Right. Um, 